Thank you, Simon. Um, evening, everyone. It's great to be with you. And um, we go in search of the, uh, the proverbial 10x, uh, 10 times start capital um, in, uh, in this evening's uh, presentation. I love that uh, Simon gives a, you know, a big thumbs up to what we found 20 years ago. Um, uh, I'm also rather uh, horrified that uh, 20 years have gone so quickly. <laughs> They have with I'm old. They've whipped by. So you know, we we spoke about you know what would be useful to explore in uh, in this evening's discussion, and um, uh, I've rounded down a tiny bit because I realised that my time in market is actually 30 years. Um, that that's when uh, I launched my first uh, investment project, uh, 1994. It's exactly 30 years, almost to the day. Uh, it was the 1st of December, 1994. So you know, here we are. And the invitation is to speak about um, uh, investment lessons, investment learnings, uh, loads of battle wounds and scars, um, hopefully a lot wiser today than I was then, certainly uh, more experienced. And so I'd like to use the time to, to do a couple of things. One, uh, just to share uh the my my ambition as an investor you know what's the purpose of allocating capital you know why are we doing it um so that we can point to uh, a purpose-filled career or purpose-led um uh, ambition and then uh, i'd like to spend uh the second uh, part of our time talking about the five big things just five things um we could probably find 10 maybe even 20, but I thought, you know, if we can distill it down to just five, you need one hand, you can remember those and go home with them. And then the third uh, thing that I'd like to do, and I'll finish up uh, with this, is I'll talk about my favorite ideas right now. Simon says no stock-specific ideas, I'll break that rule. I'll show you one. Um, and that's my favorite idea. So uh, let's go there. Right. Let's go there. Let's go there. You're going to have to help me. There we go. There we go. Okay. I've got it going. Cool. Um, so, you know, one of the, uh, one of the, the, the key aims or ambitions uh, in investing is to, is to finish with a bigger number than you started with. Um, and maybe let me just flip back here. Why have I got this picture as my holding slide? Uh, the place that you see here is called Villa Langostura, and it's a small town uh, uh, in Argentina, um, just on the side of a magnificent lake, um, Lake Argentina. And I think that this has to rank as one of the most breathtakingly beautiful places to live in the world. You can walk through forests along the coastline, swim in this beautiful water, um, walk around the streets of the small village, the cost of living is about as close to nothing as you will get. If I'm gonna finish up someplace, I wouldn't mind ending up here. So this is in one way, you know, my bucket list ambition. I don't need a wagon load of money to land up here. I need just enough. I certainly don't need as much as this guy. Now, uh, there can be almost no question that Elon Musk has got enough. Uh, he's 50 years old. That means if he lives to 100, and it's reasonable to expect, given his access to healthcare, science, medicine, that he's going to make 100. I think that that's a reasonable expectation. Uh, that gives him 17,000 days to live, and he's got uh, about $250 billion in wealth, which means uh, for the mathematicians and finance people, uh, uh, Prof. Yan, uh, he can spend. 14 million dollars a day uh, to finish with zero. <laughs> He's got enough. And uh, you know, how did he get there? One of the big ideas that I'd like to explore with you tonight is whether he got here through skill or through luck. Has he just been lucky to land up with this money? Now, 
Uh, how do we separate skill from luck? Unfortunately, in the world of investing, one of the things that I've come to learn uh, in my 25 odd years of investing is that skill and luck are frequently confused. And that when people have been very successful with their investment decisions, they look backwards and they tell you how wise they were. They misremember the story. And when they're very bad with their investment decisions, they tell you how unlucky they were. Um, uh, and that it was all a result of bad luck rather than bad design. So how do we separate skill from luck? And one of the, the habits that I got into very, very early as an investor was writing down all of my decisions, keeping a journal so that I could hold myself accountable when I look backwards to remember what I thought at the time. We are fantastic at misremembering why we do particular things. A great uh, example of evident skill is one of the most fantastic athletes of all time, Usain Bolt. And Usain Bolt competes in eight, uh, uh, competes in three Olympics, and in those three Olympics, he earns eight gold medals. It's an extraordinary record. To get those eight gold medals, total time spent on track. Anyone want to have a guess at how long he must run the actual race time to get eight gold medals? Anyone want to shout a number? Two minutes is the exact number. 120 seconds to win his 100 meters and 200 meters gold medals, his relay medals. 120 seconds. Now, why this is skill is because if any one of us lined up to race him, we would lose. And we know that skill is when you say you're going to achieve something, you, you get it done. That's skill, that you get the outcome that you plan to achieve. He says that he's going to run 100 meters in less than 10 seconds, and he generally does it 9.8 something seconds. And he will do it again and again and again, which means he can rinse and repeat. There can be no doubt that Usain Bolt is skilled. Is he lucky in running? No. Is he genetically lucky? Yes, because he was born with the right ingredients. So there is a cocktail of skill and luck going on with Usain Bolt. But when he gets on the track, it's skill. No luck going on. Let's try another one. What about this guy? Probably the best known investor of all time is Buffett Lucky. I mean, who on earth am I to suggest for one moment <laughs> that this uh, investor who has produced the, the, the most powerful return of all time might have a large dose of luck going on rather than skill? I mean, what an arrogant statement. Nothing in this is about Buffett the person. It's about the time Buffett was born, where he was born, and the shape and form in which he was born. Because Buffett was born in the United States, and when his investment career gets going, so his birth date determines when he becomes an investor. He didn't determine his birth date. And we have to wonder if he was born a few decades before and had to invest through the Great Depression if he would have the same record where capital markets fell 90% in the Great Depression. Would he have the same impressive record? We don't know. You can never test the counterfactual in finance. But Buffett, if, uh, if we think of his investment epoch or period, it's a period in which the US economy enjoys uninterrupted ascent. The US dollar becomes the global currency of choice. US capital markets rise stratospherically. US companies enjoy global dominance. And Buffett has got nothing to do with that. All of that is given to him. And imagine if you were born in an environment in which the economy is running along quickly, 
interest rates are low, inflation is stable, capital markets soar, and you participate in that environment. It's probably going to put some wind in your sails. There's just a throwaway stat that I want to give you about Buffett, and it's not a well-known throwaway stat. But if you compare his stock market performance, just the stock market part of his portfolio, the listed public part of his portfolio, and you remove Apple from his portfolio, he underperforms the S&P 500. In other words, there is one decision. It's a really, really good decision. But it is impossible to know whether Buffett is skilled or lucky. And I think it equips us as investors to always ask that question. Forget about of others. Let's ask the question of ourselves. In arriving at an investment outcome, were we skilled or are we lucky? So it was Lafarge Cement Zambia. Uh, <laughs> that's the one that you're remembering, Simon. And you know, I'd like to claim unbelievable skill. <laughs> um, but there have to be components of luck because one of the elements of luck was that Lafarge, the global cement business, came and took out the company. If that hadn't happened, maybe we wouldn't have 10x our, our capital. So there's a, without question, there's an element of luck in there. Imagine if Buffett was born in Venezuela and the Venezuelan economy has experienced absolute horror. There was a time when Venezuelans enjoyed a middle income status. They had a per person income of $12,000. But from 2015 to now, that economy has collapsed. And if Buffett had built all of his investment success in Venezuela, his $100 billion portfolio today would be worth zero. Actually, it would be worth a tiny bit more than zero because the Venezuelan Bolivar has collapsed under hyperinflation. Zimbabweans know what this feels like. And in, 2000, uh, in the year 2000, it cost you 10 Bolivar. That's the Venezuelan currency. It cost you 10 Bolivar to buy $1. You could think of 10 Rand to the dollar in 2000. And today, it costs you 83 billion Bolivar to get $1. So Buffett's portfolio would be worth a dollar. So if Buffett was born Venezuelan, he would not be as brilliant as we see now. Your circumstance matters. And this is what his Venezuelan experience would have been. Broken hospitals, broken schools, broken government, and a broken portfolio. He would be bankrupt. So the context always matters. And I'll park that first set of observations just to suggest that one of my big learnings over the 25 years is to remind myself that I also am born lucky and that I was born with particular circumstances and conditions that advantaged me. And those circumstances and conditions are my place of birth, the time of birth, the education system I went through. And the, the fact that I was able to afford to start a company in the late 1990s. Why is this lucky? Because I think the same Adrian born today, when I started that company in 1998, it was called Canon Asset Man uh, Managers. I started that company in 1998, licensed by what was the FSB at the time. I had access to enough capital and enough network to be able to start the licensed company. The same 30-year-old Adrian today to start the same company would not be able to afford the company because of the way in which regulations and, reg and capital requirements, regulatory capital requirements have changed. So I was born lucky. I'll leave that. The second thing that I want to talk about is what are, the, what are the biggest risks to investing? And the Venezuelan story has already given it away to some extent. Many people think that the biggest risk to investing is either underperforming the market. It's not. Underperforming the market is unfortunate, but it's not a disaster. Getting wiped out is a disaster. And in Venezuela, you've been wiped out. And you have been wiped out by one thing. It's called inflation. 
that in 2017, the Venezuelan economy experiences 1 million percent inflation. That's a nonsense number. You know, 1 million percent inflation, to make sense of this, it's 100 percent inflation per day. That's what Venezuelans experienced. Your money is halving in value every day in Venezuela. You cannot keep up with that. And in a short space of time, your net worth will be wiped out. So the biggest enemy that we face is not underperforming the market. That's unfortunate. It's not a disaster. Uh, paying taxes might be a privilege, if anything. Perhaps someone from SARS is listening. <laughs> but paying taxes means you are earning income and you are achieving capital gains. Uh, so paying taxes erodes. It is inflation that is the greatest destroyer of wealth. Let's make a South African example. I love this uh, uh, poster. This is KFC. Uh, and the picture is from the 1970s. And it shows you what it costs you. Can I walk with this? It shows you what it costs you to buy KFC in the 1970s. Uh, look at this one. A whole bucket. I'm from Durban, so I can't do the Afrikaans. <laughs> a whole bucket, the barley, in uh, 21 pieces, 6 rand 85. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's the exact same bucket today, the 21-piece bucket, but that 21-piece bucket today is going to cost you 250 bucks. That's inflation. And the problem with inflation for us as investors is it eats while we sleep. It just never goes away. Here, a moment to acknowledge the incredible work of Tito Mbaweni, who I'm not celebrating after the fact. For a long time, I've been a huge champion, a fan of Tito Mboweni because he did something for South Africans of all shapes and forms. He broke the back of inflation in this country. When I was growing up in the 1980s and I first became aware of prices and inflation, we experienced 15, 20% inflation. 20% inflation, prices are doubling every three and a half years. And when Tito Mboweni ushered in, inflation targeting 3 to 6% in 2000, he brought a whole new epoch uh, for us. He brought price stability. And so it is common now for us to expect and experience 4 and 5% inflation. What a magnificent uh, gift he gave us as Minister of Finance and um, uh, sorry, as Governor of the Central Bank and then as Minister of Finance. So inflation is the thing that eats while you sleep. And what we have to worry about, especially once we have gone post-income and into retirement, is this is one of the biggest challenges we face as investors. How do we make sure that we look after the purchasing power of our capital? As long as there are governments that uh, run deficits and build debt, I think that we can breathe in and out safely with the knowledge that inflation is not going anywhere. It will be a permanent feature of our investment challenge. This is what happens to uh, putting money into uh, a, a money market account. The money market account, South African cash, feels safe uh, over this 50-year investment period. You can take away the average tax rate in South Africa, 30%. That'll take your uh, money down uh, to 0.7, and inflation will finish the rest. So inflation will actually destroy all of your money sitting in the so-called safe money market account and give you 100 rand of purchasing power of one cent. Over the 55 years that I've been alive, 56 years that I've been alive, if my father, grandfather had put money into a money market account to look after me, the purchasing power of that money market account would be one cent in the rand because of inflation. Cash is not safe. Cash might be a short-term sucker punch. I'm not saying that, therefore, you should have no cash in your portfolio, but know that parking your, your money in cash, subject to tax and inflation, long-term, it's a very, very dangerous place to be. The superheroes know this. I love this cartoon. This is uh, Superman is born in 1938, uh, and if we price the cost of being Superman in 2013, uh, the cost of living for Superman, for being Superman, goes from $944 to $29,000. Nothing happens to Superman over this period. He's got the same superpower. He can fly. He can make the world go backwards. The cost of being Batman is a bit more expensive. Um, uh, he's got a higher cost of living, 
but this is all explained by inflation. So whether you want to be Superman or Batman, even the superheroes are vulnerable to inflation. No one has immunity. The biggest thing we have to worry about, and I speak uh, about this in particular, uh, having built a, a business that looks after retirement capital, the biggest thing that we have to worry about is the cost of living. So how do we protect against this? Well, uh, buying asset classes that give you real, uh, or i.e. ahead of inflation growth. That's the best way to do it. And fortunately, you know, we're sort of spoiled for choice here. Equities, historically, are the best way to do this. Buy equities, they deliver um, 5 6% ahead of inflation over long periods. They do it in a bumpy way. But if you can hold on to your equity basket, you will get real returns, i.e., positive post-inflation returns. And equities are also quite tax efficient. Um, bonds can get you ahead of inflation, but they're not nearly as tax efficient as equities. Cash after inflation and after tax will not get you ahead of, um, uh, 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 ahead of the game in real terms. So we need to be very careful about which asset class we expose ourselves to in building a portfolio. The, and the problem is the most favored asset class in terms of beating inflation is also the bumpiest. And so it starts to feel dangerous and risky. And the moment volatility enters the equation, again, you know, speaking about my experience over the years, this is where we start to take really bad decisions. This chart uh, is somewhat dated, but man, the story is not dated. Uh, this is the experience of the NASDAQ in the late 90s and into the 2000s. Just around the time that I was launching that business, uh, we went into the technology media telecoms bubble um, where the NASDAQ index went from 500 points to 2,500 points and everyone wanted tech stocks. It was almost impossible to argue that you should not have tech stocks because they've just done five times start money in the space of a couple of years. Interestingly, the most money in any one month ever going into NASDAQ, went in, in, my point has disappeared, went in that month there, March 2000, right at the top of NASDAQ. The most money ever, the most money ever to come out of NASDAQ in a month comes out there. Now, we are told in investing that the rule of successful investing is buy low, sell high. The exact opposite is happening here. And the money that's coming out at the bottom is effectively five times the money that went in at the top. People have wiped themselves out, and it wasn't NASDAQ that wiped them out. It was their behavior that wiped them out. It was their decisions to chase FOMO, fear of missing out. It's very seldom in all of this time that I've seen people chasing ideas because everyone else is chasing ideas that they've landed up in the right place. More often than not, it lands up in the wrong place. So this famous Pogo cartoon says it's, uh, uh, it's hard walking on this stuff. And uh, Pogo says, yep, uh, we've met the enemy and he is us. So the single biggest danger in investment decision making is ourselves. And that in one breath makes us dangerous, but in the next breath, if we can manage ourselves, if we can tame the beast, we get in charge of um, uh, this poor decision making. I think I've made reference to this already, um, but I'll just pass uh, uh, over this point very quickly. I love this from Morgan Housel in his book, The Psychology of Money. And he uses these charts to show how our time of birth informs or influences the way in which we think about different asset classes. So people who are born uh, in the 1950s really do not like equities. People who are born in the 1970s or almost the 1970s, I'm a 1968 baby, we love equities. People who are born in the 1960s are terrified of inflation. People who are born in the 1990s have never heard of it. <laughs> so. Your birth circumstance really shapes the way that you know, we believe 
um, uh, or, or, or see the world. They shape and influence our beliefs. That's another big lesson or learning. Let's go back to this guy um, because uh, I'll ungrumpy myself and you know, having read every single one of his investment letters, it's very hard to escape the conclusion that even if he is lucky, he is certainly also very, very wise and deeply informed and one of the most experienced investors we will ever find. So let me take away all of that earlier grumpiness about, well, he got lucky with Apple. Man, this guy is wise and informed. And here's one of my favorite quips, one of his, my favorite utterances of his. He says, investing is simple, but not easy. And it's not easy because of this problem. It's not easy because of us. So how do we make uh, investing easy? I don't know if this comes out uh, uh, on this chart. Do some people see white and gold here? White and gold dress. Anyone see black and blue? Cool. I've got enough nods to know that some people see white and gold and some see people see black and blue. And you know that tells us that there are lots of different ways of seeing the world. Uh, this is the exact same picture. There's no tricks going on here. This is the famous optical illusion uh, or, or uh, illusion that happened on social media where there was fierce debate on social media whether this dress was white and gold or black and blue. Uh, if you want to delve into the social history of this, there's a long, long, long standing debate about what the color of this dress is and why we see it differently. Uh, what if we can drop our lenses of seeing the market in different ways? and rather agree on how we make investing not just simple, but also easy. So here are the five things that I think make investing really, really easy. The first is it is impossible to ignore the conclusion or the outcome that the single most powerful driver of your investment result is time. The earlier you start, the better your chances. The later you start, the bigger the panic. Time is the single most powerful ingredient. This is a very naive exercise, but I think it shows the importance of time in driving investments. Imagine you put a thousand rand a month into an investment and you earn a a respectable after inflation, eight and a half percent. This is what you would have earned in a balanced South African fund over the last 30 years. So you put a thousand rand a month in and you just do it religiously. You never interrupt yourself. You don't worry about what the market is doing, going up, down, what some media personality says about something is expensive. You should panic. Stop listening. Just keep putting in the thousand bucks a month. If you start at 45 years old, you'll finish with 634,000. If you start 15 years earlier at 30 years old, you'll finish with 2.4 million. If you start 15 years earlier at 15 years old, you will finish with 8 million. And if you start at birth, or perhaps if your parents start at birth, you will finish with 26 million. These numbers are after inflation. These are adjusted for inflation. All you need to do is a thousand rand a month and never get in your own way. Now, you may not have a thousand. You might only have a hundred. Okay, then knock a zero off each of these. Move the comma one place. You might not have a hundred. You might only have 10. Then move the comma another place. And you might, bless you, not have 1,000. You might have 10,000. And then you finish with a quarter of a billion rand. Time is the single most powerful ingredient. One of the biggest compromises of time, challenges of time, is fees. Don't worry about the fees that you are paying for investing. Obsess about your fees. And I'm not saying that you should pay no fees. <laughs> then my money's gone. <laughs> my business blows up. But be hyper vigilant that you are paying the right fee for the right investment. What these uh, uh, Manhattan show you is the managers that outperform their benchmarks. And as we go from left to right across different mandates, 
each of them is going from the highest cost manager or the lowest cost manager to the highest cost manager. Before you allocate any money to an investment, ask this question first. What do I have to pay for it? And is the fee that I'm paying for it appropriate? Unfortunately, our industry is littered with very elevated fees and lots of traps and pitfalls that ensnare you through fee structures. Be hyper vigilant and alive to fees. The third thing to, uh, uh, to worry about, or the third principle that I'd put on the table is it's extremely hard to beat the market. How hard? Well, I've been having a go at it for the better part of my 30 years in capital markets. It's exceptionally difficult to beat the market. And in fact, the only way that you can beat the market over the long term is by experiencing very high levels of bumpiness, knowing that there will be times when the market beats you by a long way. So you have to tolerate huge patches of underperformance in order to enjoy outperformance. I'll come back to this in a moment. For the most part, why should you buy the market? Well, Bernard Baruch, I love this uh, quote from him. He says, uh, if you want to beat the market, you need to be ready to give up everything, to study the whole of history, the background of the market, all principal companies or stocks on the board, as carefully as a medical student studies anatomy. If you can do all of that, and in addition, you have the cool nerves of a gambler, the sixth sense of a clairvoyant, and the courage of a lion, then you have a ghost of a chance of beating the market. <laughs> For the most part, it is unbelievably difficult to beat the market. How many managers beat the market? Well, when we give enough time to get evidence of skill, not luck, say 10, 15, or 20 years, only one in five, one in 10 managers beats the market. For the most part, the market beats managers. So how do you cure for that? You buy an index. You buy an index. You don't buy a manager who is advertising to beat the index because overwhelmingly the odds are stacked against you. But remember, we've met the enemy and the enemy is us. We don't like to do that because we rather think that we are good at selecting managers who advertise the skill and capability of beating the market. We've met the enemy. The enemy is us. Thing four is in buying the market, you don't buy one thing in the market. You buy lots of things in the market. If there is a free lunch, in, let me start that uh, uh, idea again. I think that there is only one free lunch in investing, and it's called diversification. And diversification means you put a couple of different eggs in the basket. You're well versed in this. You know the dangers of holding a single company, a single asset class, or one great idea in a single currency. Imagine being the most fantastic Venezuelan investor saying, I own this fantastic company in Venezuela, in the Bolivar, you're wiped out. Imagine if that investor had taken half of their money and put it outside of Venezuela or even a quarter, they would have something. And so diversification is the first insurance against bad decisions, against poor outcomes. Diversification does something else. There's a magnificent maths. Simon, do you share these slides? Okay, so uh, afterwards, um, in your Thursday evening reading, uh, you can have a chance to uh, skim through these slides and the place you want to pay attention is to the far right hand, uh, the two far, uh, far right hand columns. They show what happens if you buy a portfolio that consists of a single asset, government bonds that generate 5% year in, year out. That single asset that generates the 5% return will grow from 100 to 323. If you diversify and just naive diversification, you don't buy the 5% government bonds. You put one-fifth of your portfolio into gold, one-fifth into cash, one-fifth into bonds, one-fifth into property, one-fifth into equities. If you do the math, the math on this top line is very simple. The average return for those five asset classes is 5%. But because you've got a fifth, a fifth, a fifth, a fifth, a fifth, you actually get the one-fifth of each of these compound. 
And when you do the math of this bottom line, you land up with 431. There's no trick maths here. It's the simple elegance that having just a fifth of your portfolio in the most powerful compounder, and even the fact that you have a fifth of the portfolio in something that does zero, gives you a return that is better than having 100% in the safest asset class. There is only one free lunch in investing, and it's called diversification. And I would urge you to think about how diversified your portfolio is. The fifth thing that I'd like to show you, and this is my uh, uh, stopping point, is manage yourself. That's one of the things that I've learned uh, over all of this time. And what I mean by this, when I wrote this down, I had to think sort of really hard about what I, what I meant by this. I love capital markets. I have loved capital markets from the first time I became aware of them as a teenager. I used to listen to the radio in the early evenings when they would read out stock prices and tell us you know, what the foreign exchange had done through the day. And I got a bit bored when they got to government bonds. I didn't really know what they were doing you know, at that point. But I loved listening to what was going on with share prices, De Beers. Waltons, Basil Reed. These are some of my early memories of listening to the radio. The fact that my father was in business and would bring home a business day every now and then. That was like he had brought home a wheelbarrow of gold and I could read the business day. Didn't matter that it was three days old, a week old. And that just fed my absolute fascination. Now, if I do all of the things that I've done, and I now go and buy an index with low fees of diversified assets, how boring. <laughs> how boring. And what I will respond you know, to that portfolio is I'll be watching it and trying to interfere with it and get the asset allocation right and seeing how I tilt things and nudge things on a daily basis, I'm going to become a busy idiot. And so I distract myself with my favorite investment. And my fav favorite investment is a portfolio called Hummingbird. I've run this portfolio since 1996. It's a gorgeous uh, uh, maturity. 20 odd years of investing uh, in the Hummingbird portfolio. And a hummingbird allows me to express all of my best ideas. And I know that some of these ideas might be hopelessly wrong. But if I don't bet the farm, if I bet something on this, if I allocate some part of my portfolio to this, I can get the deep, deep experience of this fantastic portfolio of understanding single company ideas deeply and obsessing about how that business is doing, what's happened to cause it to be better or worse. And if that is the case, the world is your oyster and you can go to Mars. So you know, what could you do? If you don't have your own hummingbird, you might have some other things that really fascinate you. Some ideas. You could invest in cars. You could invest in diamonds and jewelry. Notice how far they are ahead of the All World Index. You could invest in burgundy wine. And these are expressions of your interest. I don't know, you know what interests you, but it allows you to put into your portfolio even indices of things that you just love. You know, you can buy an index of handbags. <laughs> Isn't that neat? So here's my hummingbird. This is my handbag index. This is my burgundy cars diamond investment. That a part of my portfolio, about a quarter of my family portfolio, is invested in hummingbird. Hummingbird has been around since 1996. It started its life as a 
as an investment called Superdogs. Um, when I went into, uh, we were acquired uh, in a corporate investment, and one of the principals, that corporate, one of the managers came to me and said, no one is going to buy a fund called Superdogs. <laughs> okay, uh, message taken. And so we rebranded the portfolio. We called it Hummingbird. Small ideas, beautiful colors. They can move around, high agility. And so Superdogs, which is a portfolio made up of unloved but fantastic businesses. They are under-researched, unknown, but they are profitable. They've got established market histories. That is the origins of Superdogs, 1996. Over this period, you can see what uh, the portfolio has done from 96 to now. You'll get a sense of just how bumpy it is. Uh, in 96, a magnificent start year, 34% gain. Some horror years, minus 31% in 2008. That's global financial crisis. A hallelujah year, 2004, 75% up. Um, and so far this year, wow, we're having a fantastic time this year. We're up 25% with uh, investments in Pan-African Resources, the gold mining company, which has had uh, a wonderful uh, 2024. Lewis Furnishes has been in the portfolio. That's had a fantastic year. Um, and African Rainbow Capital is also in the portfolio. We've had these for a long time. You've got to be patient with these ideas. And I'd like to describe this portfolio as essentially listed private equity. These are businesses that if I could buy the entire business, I would buy all of it. Simon and I were talking just before the start, you know, that the problem with these businesses, if you get it wrong, it's yours forever. <laughs> no one's coming to buy it from you. So the homework doesn't need to be deep. It needs to be hyper deep, ultra deep. You need to do two kilometers underground homework. Uh, on these businesses. If you had put capital in in 1996 and not touched it, you would have 80 times start money. That's a really good result. And it is a long, long way ahead of the 18 times start money that you would get by being in the market. So we have beaten the index here by a very, very handsome distance. But it has happened with high volatility. Down the bottom here, I report the volatility here, 22% volatility versus the market's 18% volatility. But this has beaten the market and has beaten inflation. Here are my favorite ideas in the portfolio right now. Oh, no, no, not my favorite ideas. This is the portfolio right now. I show you everything. Some managers don't believe in transparency. I believe in full transparency. You got to know what you're investing in. And so I show you everything that you own in real time. And here's my portfolio right now. Um, one of my favorite ideas, I'll, I'll just run through them super, super quickly. I'm watching the time. Um, uh, Santova logistics business built uh, uh, out of Durban. And uh, uh, this is taken over by Glenn Gerber in the early 2000s. He's ex-Investec. Um, this company has grown earnings 40% per year uh, since it was uh, listed. Uh, Sabest Capital, Chris Seabrook's uh, business, Sabest Capital trades at 75, 80 rand a share. It's an investment holding company. Uh, the net asset value is 110 rand. So you're paying 75 cents uh, for 110 cents in assets, 75 rand for 110 rand in assets. And since this company was listed in 1988, Seabrook has compounded returns at 22% per annum. I think he is one of the most astute capital allocators in this country. And essentially what he's saying to you is you can buy my company, which compounds at 22% per annum for 70 cents in the rand. Wow. Um, that might be, I said there was only one free lunch. That might be a second free lunch um, or at least an hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of real estate, but one of the real estate investment ideas that I like is storage. It's a distinctly different uh, model. Uh, it has gazillions of small customers who each rent out 10 square meters, three by threes, where they store furniture um, and their granny's belongings. Uh, storage has 90% occupancy. They have inflation plus uplifts, and they've done really clever things in terms of gray water, um, going off grid, and so on. 
uh, this company now has about one third of its earnings outside of South Africa being very successful in a, a UK acquisition. British American Tobacco, uh, even I surprised myself by owning this, but what I love is that British American Tobacco is distinctly different to anything else in the portfolio, i.e. diversification. Uh, and even if they don't grow earnings, they're giving us all of the cash back each year in the form of a very, very elevated dividend. So it's a fantastic diversifier and uh, it pays me money back while I wait. Data Tech, uh, an under-researched, unknown South African company. It continues to release portfolio value, um, most of the earnings, almost all of the earnings are global. It earns nothing in South Africa. Um, Astoria, uh, this is Pete Fulhoun's um, uh, business, and Astoria trades at 60 cents in the Rand, net asset value play, uh, also a holding company. Uh, and uh, Pete Fulhoun has compounded uh, earnings very similar to Seabrook style, 20% plus per annum, and you're paying 60 cents in the Rand for 20%. Um, compounding. Calgro, hard to find anyone talking about this company, um, and for a long time this company was deeply disliked. Uh, Calgro has just announced earnings this past week. Calgro trades uh, on a very low single-digit price earnings multiple. I think the PE translates to about four times. Four times price earnings multiple, and uh, the net asset value is 12 Rand per share, and you're paying seven rand for the company, 12 rand of property assets. Clientel has the longest uninterrupted earnings record on the JSC of all listed companies. Um, the way that you value an insurance company is embedded value, embedded value for clientele about 18 rand a share. You're paying 12 rand a share to own the company and it's giving you a 10 dividend yield. Uh, Hudeco, uh, a, a brilliant supplier to equipment businesses, Lewis, uh, the reason why the market has set up hallelujah style, I think, is a, twin, a, a two pot um, and that they see the retail um, uh, spend coming back to the furniture industry. African Rainbow Capital uh, is Patrice Motsepe's um, uh, investment company. Argent Industrial, um, this is a hard headed CEO, uh, um, <laughs> but what uh, Argent has done um, over the last couple of years in particular is very successfully diversified outside of South Africa and especially into the UK. Richemont, who doesn't want to own a handbag? And then BHP, this is actually our play on artificial intelligence um, because artificial intelligence companies have gone into stupid pricing, but for artificial intelligence to run, you need copper. You need energy. And here's one of the world's biggest copper businesses. So we've got a second derivative play on copper, uh, BHP Billiton. My favorite, favorite idea in all of this, I skipped over it very, very briefly, it's African Rainbow Capital. You can buy shares in African Rainbow Capital at 7 Rand. The net asset value is 12 Rand. And the big idea in African Rainbow Capital is Time Bank. Um, this is their fastest growing asset. Time Bank has gathered up 10 million customers in South Africa. It feels a little sacrilegious saying this inside of Standard Bank. I might not be invited back, <laughs> but uh, very different customer, um, a completely different uh, market position. Time Bank, only digital banking. You can't go and see a Time Bank. It takes you about five minutes to onboard as a customer. You only need a fingerprint and a photograph. They'll do the rest through triangulation. Um, and uh, they've, uh, they have 10 million customers in South Africa. That's not the exciting part. They've recently gone to Philippines um, where they are onboarding 10,000 customers a day in the Philippines. Uh, next expansion is to Vietnam, then Indonesia. Um, and under Konrad Jonker, this business is destined for a 2028 New York Stock Exchange listing. Um, this company, uh, if we take this read at face value, this company is worth many times the current uh, seven rand a share. It's not 10 times the seven rand a share, but it is certainly multiples of, uh, of the seven rand a share. So those are some ideas. Um, I, I, I wasn't invited to advertise, but if anyone is interested in, in, in coming into this portfolio, uh, you can come into it directly. Um, uh, a hummingbird is available um, to individual investors. As a closing point, um, be very careful of a couple of things. 
in my 25 years, I've learned of some ways in which money is wiped out. And it's when people get animated and hyperbolic uh, about particular things, suggesting that if you don't own this, you're an idiot. These are the crypto punks. What absolute nonsense. <laughs> if you don't understand it, don't buy it. And one of these was advertised, I think, for $100 million. <laughs> if you don't understand it, don't buy it. That's the rule. Be very careful of these. Watch out for these. Watch out for Elizabeth Holmes. Watch out for Steinhoff stories. Watch out for Bernie Madoff. If people promise you things that sound too good to be true, they're too good to be true. Stay a long, long way away. Our humanness makes us want to believe the story. But our world is filled with fraudsters. Be very careful of them. That our caution and cynicism will equip us well in thinking about investors. And then expect these. What I mean by this is expect shocks and surprises. I love, um, I love the artificial intelligence here, which is the alt text is a group of people hugging each other. <laughs> you know, maybe he wins uh, in November. Maybe he doesn't. But know that our ability to see over the hill and forecast exactly, impossible. So build a portfolio that is designed uh, to navigate turbulent times. Because of the turbulent times on today, they're just around the corner. Here's how I always think about investing that investing is about a process. And if you've got a good process, you might, luck is evenly distributed. And sometimes you'll have bad luck, sometimes you'll have good luck. But if you've got a good process, you can navigate and negotiate the bad luck, the good luck will come. And your good process, when it meets the good luck, you get the deserved success that is due to you as an investor. Very, very last slide um, is, what, the, the last thing I wanted to share is 30 years on, I am still absolutely fascinated by capital markets. I never want to stop experiencing and learning about them. And so I thought it would be a nice place to finish here and share with you my professorial hat. These are some of my favorite reads. Very quickly, 100 years old, Ben Graham's book is still brilliant. James Montier this book, Behavioral Investing, each chapter is eight, nine, ten pages. And it's a story about why you shouldn't fire your manager, why you should fire your manager, why you should be careful of balance sheets, etc. Seth Klarman, um, the builder of Baupost, um, he uh, writes the book Margin of Safety. You can't buy this book. Uh, actually, you can on Amazon for about two and a half thousand um, dollars. That's the list price. But you can find PDF copies of it. Applied value investing, uh, Joseph Calandro, I would venture is one of the most powerful reads on how you value a business. It is just wise and carefully thought out, and it doesn't require CFA3. All of us can do it. Uh, Michael Lewis writes magnificently on investing, and in his book Moneyball, he tells us how to put together a portfolio, that a portfolio of a whole bunch of fairly good ideas are much better then your effort to constantly search out the best of the best of the best and overpay for the best of the best of the best. Atul Gawanda is a surgeon and he reminds us of the importance in surgery that the thing that kills most people in hospitals is doctors and nurses. And that's process, that you need to obsess about process. Triumph of the Optimists, 120 years of market history. And then the Manual of Ideas is John Mahaljevich, who interviews uh, a dozen magnificent managers around the world and takes us into their heads and their hearts and find how they think about investing. That's where we go. 180 seconds. <laughs> Thank you. It was Springbok Radio, six o'clock. They used to come on and they would do, there was no uh, uh, Bruce Whitfield or Alec Hogg back in the late 80s, early yeah. 90s. Six o'clock in the evening, Springbok Radio, someone would come on, give you the gold price, the Rand exchange oh. rate, the bonds, and then go through the entire market, A to Z, every <laughs> single stock, give you the move 
and the price that it closed for that day, yeah. and it would have me riveted. Yeah. <laughs> Deal like, crawl, <laughs> Durban deep, <laughs> and all of those sort of things. Ladies and gents, I'm going to park it because we have hit time. Uh, Adrian, huge thanks to you. It thank is, you, Simon, and so, thank you so, to everyone here listening. There, 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 there were a couple of convolutions of questions that I quickly want to come to, and one of them was ideal number of stocks in a portfolio, and the thing that struck me with Hummingbird small portfolio yeah very small portfolio but remember it sits alongside my Correct. my multi-asset balance funds yeah, yeah. yeah so that's a small set of ideas and i know every one of those businesses so, really uh, really well yeah, yeah and i hold cogra so there's someone who knows about <laughs> it uh, i take your point about less media the other question that came through is when do you write a book um i'm in the process of writing a book right now with um, Hard work, hey? It's a, it's a hell of a lot of work, um, and the reason why I'm animated about Time Bank, thank, and thank you for asking, it allows me to declare my conflict of interest. So I'm writing a book on Time Bank with Bruce Whitfield. Ha, yeah, due next year. Next year. <laughs> Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. Adrian, always an absolute honor to have you. Uh, thank and, you. Uh, your thoughts. Ladies and gents, thank you very much for coming through. Uh, folks in the webcast as well, you, as I always say. You had a lot of places you could have given your hour to. You chose us this evening. Uh, remember, if you're in the building, validate your parking ticket. Look after yourself if you can. Look after somebody else as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.